You are a billboard, basically, right? Yes. You agree to become to, to work all year for the opportunity to become a billboard for your country. And you maybe get maybe get fifteen thousand dollars only if you win. If so you, that's what I'm saying. Olympians maybe. in the U.S. do not get paid to compete in the games unless they win a medal. I I share all of this to say the thought ran through my head. Why would anyone do this? Like, what is there to gain? Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. And today's episode is going to be a little bit of a mishmash of what's on our mind. We're giving you mish-mash. three... Mishmash. Mishmash? Mix, mix mash? Mashup. <laughs> Mashup <laughs> of what's on our mind. We are giving you three, maybe like 10, I don't know, hot takes on some things that we've been talking about that we just want to discuss. Yeah. We want to converse. But first, before we dive in, I wanted to give a shout out to Aqua Boogie, or it could be Aqua Bougie, but I think it's Aqua Boogie, who left a five-star review with this comment called Episode 172, Great Episode. And the comment said, if you haven't already, you should check out Jessica McCabe's How to ADHD on IG or YouTube. She recently wrote a book too, and she's been a great help for me. I did, and she is wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, and she's pretty cool. Yeah, like thanks to everybody who has sent loving words or book and podcast recommendations. We have officially crossed over 400 reviews on Apple Podcasts. We're at 403. So I feel like alive again. I've got all these new resources that I can look at, and I got new reviews coming in for our podcast because <laughs> I started to feel like Apple was holding back on us. Like, it was just like staying right at three ninety nine for was. like a long time. But that's time. what happens when you over focus on the metrics. Anytime you're looking at something and you just obsess about it, that's when you see like the least amount of movement. That's so true. You gotta walk away. You just gotta leave it and you come back and wake up and there's like three, four more reviews in there. Yes. I'm gonna jump in and give another shout out to Nikki Connoisseur. I like that name. Nikki Connoisseur, who left a YouTube comment on another video. This was another one in reference to the ADHD episode, and they recommended another book. Uh, it was ADHD and Us, and the comment was, it's a really good book for a couple that is comprised of a neurotypical and a neurodivergent person. It has actionable steps, screens, etc. So thank you for that. Those are two book recommendations for anyone who might be in our type of situation. Yes, and there's one more that came through a lot. It's called Small Talk. Okay. And it's basically a neurotypical and neurodiverse husband-wife couple that wrote a book on like the myths surrounding ADHD. This might be a reality. I know. Show. Mark my <laughs> this. When it happens, y'all make sure y'all tag us because I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a reality show. If it, if it isn't already, it probably already is. Uh, yeah. And they just haven't revealed that that's the secret ingredient of what makes it interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, I think he used the word mishmash. I want to explain what that means. And so basically, you know, we typically find one topic and we go a little deeper for around 30, 40 minutes. Sometimes, as is the case for the last couple of episodes, we've gone a little longer. In this case, these are topics that I don't really think we could go that much longer with it other than maybe like five or 10 minutes. And oftentimes we're really interested in something, but we don't really have a place for it. We don't know how to turn that into an entire podcast. And so we said, well, I'm just mix them all up and make a cocktail of topics that we can kind of squeeze into one particular episode. And it also gives us an opportunity to react, I think, in a little bit more real time with whatever might be hot. And so it is early August. And unless you just aren't watching television at all, there's lots of things going on, one of them being the Olympics. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as a few other topics of conversation. And so before we do that, just let us know, like, what do you think? Uh, this is a model that we should be doing, <laughs> incorporating a little bit more. I think we're going to do it anyway. Right? Yes. We're going to try it out a little bit more. <laughs> She's very excited about it. <laughs> yes. Here's why I'm excited about it. One, it just pleases my ADHD brain. Like the first time that you suggested it, I think I came up with eight mini topics Instantly. Oh yeah. It was like, oh my gosh, all the <laughs> all the things. Let's go over eight stories. And he my, was like, was how like, about yeah. three? Like yeah, <laughs> you can just table the other ones. No, we could do it. <laughs> I was squeeze definitely gonna squeeze in them all in. Forty five minutes. <laughs> it also scratches my money on the table itch. Like it reminds me of how dinner party conversations go, at least when I'm there. 
Like I'm that person that's always, <laughs> I'm the person at the end of the table, always bringing up random facts and observations for conversational fodder. Like I'm just going to throw it out there and see what the table says. Yeah. So this feels very similar to that. If you've ever wondered what it's like to have me at a party, I'm very fun. It's a very <laughs> intro. You're about to get some invitations. And then the third reason is really about y'all because it allows us to plant a seed. We talk about how the pace of change is like so fast. And what that means is that sometimes the lesson or the insight hasn't been fully formed yet. It hasn't developed yet. Like we're still mid whatever change this is going to be. Yeah. And so as the trend is still unraveling, we at least want to make sure that you're aware of it and you can start to track it. And like very similar to when you learn a new word, you start to see it. You might hear it somewhere and listen a little differently or just think about things differently. And so I'm excited for this speed dating-esque type podcast. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Um, I want to start with the first topic of conversation. And this also gives me an opportunity to use my favorite sound. It's the Jamaican in me. It's the Jamaican <laughs> in me that loves a good ear horn. Um, I hinted towards this uh, a few minutes ago, the Olympics. And I want to give a little bit of backstory as to why like, I'm particularly interested in this topic. So if you guys follow us on social media, or at least follow me, uh, you know that I am very heavily invested into our son's baseball journey. I spoke about it on an earlier podcast episode. Things have gotten um, better or worse, depending on how you view it. But like, it's, it's a lot. It's a big part of his life right now. It's a big part of my life. We're really enjoying it. It's, it's a, become a family affair. He's going to a couple of games. We have a few more games on the agenda. And so naturally as a parent, you start to think like, wow, like where does this go? He's got all these advantages and he's showing all these skills. And then the Olympics came around and I started thinking about the Olympics and hearing the stories of all of these Olympians. But then like that warm, fuzzy feeling of like what was possible kind of went away. And it's not just because like those aren't my kids. It was because I was like, I can't actually think of very many successful stories. And I'm not like trying to diss like Olympics or Olympians or anyone that chooses this as a lifestyle. But like naturally my thought was like, what is the end goal here? Like, what do you do when you're done? Because we do know that these careers are over pretty early. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was like, all right, well, sure, you can naturally be an ambassador for the sport or the game or whatever it is. But like, what, what is the end goal financially for these people? And I knew I wasn't the only person thinking this because like immediately as I went to YouTube, I started seeing all of these other comments. And then there've been a couple of articles that were talking about like Olympics and Olympians and how much money they make and how much money really they aren't making mm -hmm. relative to other countries. And there was a particular article, uh, it was in Business Insider, we'll link to it in the YouTube description, in the podcast description, and it was literally titled, Why Are Olympians So Broke? And it, it was just like, it is what it is. And and I I think I kind of knew this, but I was really shocked when I watched the video and I started reading around. And so I want to highlight a couple of findings from this article, uh, and this might be a scattering of findings from a couple of them, but there was a global study that they conducted with 500 elite athletes and they found that nearly 60% did not consider themselves financially stable. 50% of track athletes who rank in the top 10 in the United States in their event earn less than drum roll. I don't even have to say that. I actually have a drum roll, but I don't feel like pressing it. Um, they earn less than $15,000 annually from the sport. This is according to the Washington Post. And they went on and they started talking about like the differences between the United States and some of these other countries. And I thought that was particularly interesting as well. So there's a huge gap, like huge gap, right? So the United States is ranked number nine. And you might hear that and say, oh, well, that's actually not that bad. But like there's a giant difference between number nine and like even number six, right? right? Or and certainly between number one. But I did some numbers and this was very simple, second grade math. If you add up what a gold medalist, silver medalist, and a bronze medalist make from the United States, that equates to what a bronze medalist would get from Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan is number two, mm. right? So number one is Singapore, but Kazakhstan is number two. They pay their bronze medalists $75,000. In the United States, gold medalists get 37500 silver medalists get 22500 and a bronze medalist gets... $15,000.
right? So Kazakhstan's number two, Singapore's number one. We're not going to go through all of them, but like Singapore, you want a gold medal, you get $737,000. Silver, $369,000. Bronze, $184,000. Which makes sense because you're competing on behalf of the country. It brings your country a lot of fame and recognition and attention. It makes people want to train there. It brings... All this tourism, visibility. all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. But in you, the US, you are, you are a billboard basically, right? Yes. You agree to become, to, to work all year for the opportunity to become a billboard for your country. And you maybe get, maybe get $15,000. Only if you win. If so you, that's what I'm saying. Olympians maybe. in the US do not get paid to compete in the games unless they win a medal. I, I share all of this to say the thought ran through my head. Why would anyone do this? Like, what is there to gain? Like, uh, obviously, there's a love of the sport. There is the value that the discipline and all of these things afford you. But I really, I I question, I was like, wow, if my son becomes really passionate about something and presents this as an idea or an opportunity, am I going to be in favor of it? Or do I present him this podcast episode and the numbers and say, I mean, it's on you, but like, I am not particularly interested in signing up to spend my life Listen. and all of our money supporting this particular thing. And and here's the thing. I, I enjoy watching it every now and then. Everybody does. But it brings the world together. The, like very rarely is the world watching the same thing at right. the same time, which is what makes this so exploitative. It, exactly. And, and my spidey sense always goes off. It goes crazy whenever I see people who are hyper visible. I mean, their faces are everywhere, but they're broke. Because it is the indicator that it's been some exploitation going down and not like of the little kind. Because when you talk about the Olympics, you're talking about billion dollar global events fueled by sponsorships, broadcasting rights, company government money. It's a massive money making machine. NCAA energy. That's what I was just about to say. And I was like, yeah, no. It's very NCAA. Like very, very like something has to change. And I remember we were talking about this the other day. The Olympics were hosted here in Atlanta in 1996. So I could be biased, but I generally think things used to be different. Like when I was coming up, Olympians were godlike. Michael Johnson was on the cover of the Wheaties box. You know, there was uh, Usain Bolt was a brand. Like I wasn't Jamaican, but I knew how to do the thing with my arms. Dominique Dawes, Jackie Joyner Kersey. I mean, that was before my times, but still like these were godlike creatures. And the other day we were watching the men's track And we both looked at each other like Noah Lyles, who is the fastest man on the planet right now. Like, why is he not more famous? Like, how come people don't know? If I walked in a mall right now in Atlanta and asked 10 people who this person is, I had a picture of Noah Lyles. Like, I think most of them would say- Fastest man in the world. Tristan Thompson. Or it's like, (laughs) (laughs) like, I think I went to high school with him. Like, he looks like somebody we all know, but his face is not- recognizable. And I think there's been this whole shift around sponsorship dollars, around funding for these Olympians, because people talk about sponsorships like they're the end all be all like, okay, you don't make money from the games, but Nike sends you a check or Reebok sends you a check, whatever. But the reality is there's a maybe, right? Like there's a post Olympics cliff. So a lot of sponsorships are tied to the athlete's performance. And so if you don't win, it can dwindle really quickly after the game. A lot of sponsorships are focused on the Olympic cycle in and of itself. And then there are some sports that are more popular than others. Like Nike might have blown the budget on the men's basketball team and they don't have any money for Noah. Or maybe they're sponsoring something else, gymnastics, whatever. It's just not as simple as it sounds, like even for the fastest man in the world. Yeah, I really um, wish I'd come across this data like when we were writing the book, because I without question would have written about this or like drawn a comparison between this and what I think so many people are doing in their professional and their academic careers. Right. Like this constant pursuit of excellence that we see so many people do. We talked about this in uh, Money on the Table season three as well, but like. There just has to be a limit, I think. And yeah. and I'm I'm not I don't want to dissuade anyone from pursuing their passion, right? But like it it just very much it was triggering, right? Because we talk a lot about excellence and certainly like black excellence. And then this kind of rubs up against the idea of like hard work paying off. And, you know, if, if you pursue your passion, then you know, it never feels like a day of work. And I was like, well, tell that to the person, I I should have screenshotted it, but like, tell that to the person that was on Twitter earlier today that said she was getting ready to compete. And she was also very clearly saying that 
She can't but pay I rent. don't know how to pay my rent. Yeah. So you saw that too, right? Thank God for Flavor Flav. Flavor Flav jumps and in. And Alexis O'Han. And Alexis. O- Olympi- what's his name? <laughs> oh, O'Hanan. Or, or, O'Hanian. O'Hanian. There's, Olympian. There's a, there's a Y in there somewhere. But uh, Serena, Serena Williams' <laughs> husband who jumped in and said, yeah, I'll, I'll split it with you, right? But like, this is shameful. It's shameful. This is shameful. And to your point, this is wildly exploitative. And so I, I'm, I'm okay with being misinterpreted because I know ultimately what I really feel like I'm doing is standing up for these people who have dedicated their lives to this sport on behalf of their country and they're struggling to pay rent. I mean, there was an article, I think, or another article or video that we saw where there was someone who said, yeah, like they do DoorDash or something. Mm-hmm. Like that. Can you imagine mm-hmm. a, a literal Olympian delivering your DoorDash they do because a that's what bit they need to do? I used to work with a former Olympian. He had stopped like competing, but he had been to the Olympics in his youth and he had a job just like me. Like, Yeah. And, and, and again, this is why I, I presume, you know, there's probably a gold medal on eBay right now. Oh, there might be. That somebody could buy yeah. because somebody is just in need or, you know, they make a donation or something like that to a museum or something like that. Right. Because they kind of need the money and they can always go see it, but they can't actually keep it in their home because right. they kind of need the money. So all of that to say, I actually disagree with you, with you saying that they were godlike. They may have been godlike, but they certainly weren't paid. As such, I, I don't know that much has changed at all, in my opinion. I, I think it was very similar. We may have had a few more U.S. stars back then, but I doubt the money was flowing in before and it stopped. Yeah. You know, I feel like it just never was the case. And I think the vast majority of people, with the exception of a few outliers, just simply aren't making money. And so, no, we're not talking about Simone Biles or, you know, Michael Phelps, like the, you know, the Decky, I believe is her last mm-hmm. team, who's crushing it uh, with swimming right now. Like, we're not talking about those people who have very clear sponsorships and are in commercials. We're talking about like the other 99%. Right. Like the people who are collegiate athletes, the people who are probably in incredible shape, but working at Starbucks over the summer to help make ends meet. So I think you're right that there is something to be learned or gleaned about careers and corporate life from the Olympics, because it's interesting that the the spirit behind the games is based on amateurism. Like yes. It's based on like the love of the sport. That's what this is all about. It's about people who are passionate and showing, and that's why they don't pay people. But that is complete bullshit because these people have to give up their entire lives to become professionals and they break records. Like they set new world standards for whatever the sport is going to be. And then they represent their country and then we don't take care of them. Yeah. So it definitely makes me question what the real cost of excellence is. And I don't mean like generic black excellence because you, you know, did something cool. (laughs) I mean like excellence with a capital E that requires you to sacrifice for it. And I'm starting to feel like you really shouldn't pursue excellence in anything where you don't know that you have a genetic or a neurological advantage. I think certainly not in exchange for visibility, because that is the angle, going back to the book, that we did take, where we were cautioning people around visibility, because in our experience in these corporate environments, there is oftentimes that requirement, where if you do these things, then you will then be allowed to come to these meetings, or you can access to these things. And like, I don't want any of those things. What I want is more pay. Right. What I want is a subsidization of these particular benefits that allow me to save more money. Like this is about me exchanging my talent for money and not being shamed for confronting that reality and, right. or prioritizing that reality. And I think that is the, the the cautionary tale that we're seeing here. In the book, we use the example of the young lady who was in the thriller video. Because oh, I, yeah. I remember seeing... <laughs> You know, like that, that is the reminder that I want everyone to share with themselves, right? Like imagine being in the thriller video and everybody who's watching What's this. What's her name? Ola Ray? This, this is my point. <laughs> this is my point. I'm over here thinking like, what is her name? You, If somebody <laughs> told you, you have a chance to be in the biggest, most expensive video by the world's most popular artists, you will be seen by millions of people around the world. Most people would say, Sign me up because they feel like, oh my, my gosh, life I, my change. life is about to change. Yeah. And we do this all the time. We say, I bet that person, We could, doesn't matter what we're watching. We say it all the time. It's like, I bet that person thought their life was going to change the next day and nothing happened. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. So always, always, always prioritize, be selfish yeah. a little bit. Don't yeah. prioritize your well-being, your family's financial foundation for a little bit of visibility. 
Yeah. This is likely not going to pay off. Make sure Unless you Unless you're super clear on what your advantage is. I was about to say. Like that 1%, they all have biological or neurological advantages. Like Michael Phelps has like ungodly wingspan and like feet that work like dolphins and, and a body that produces, yeah, less lactic acid. I was reading a story about the pummel horse guy, Steven with the glasses. Yeah, yeah. And he's cross-eyed, but he has the ability to switch his dominant eye like going from left to right. It's like having an A cam and a B cam. Like he can change his worldview. Like a chameleon. Yeah. And he also is like sensitive to light. And so what that gives him is an advantage around touch and feel. Ah. The same is true for Simone Biles. She started taking gymnastics when she was six and it developed her ability to know where she is in space. Like I forgot the word. I think it's proreceptive sense it's some sense of for you to know like where your body and what your body is doing in space yeah and she's able to like fly through the air because she knows exactly where her feet are and that's how she lands on them every time but the point is like unless you take the time to discover what that superpower is and i truly believe we all have one you just don't know it because you're not put in the right environments to test and learn and experiment and get feedback yeah once you understand what that is, then go for it. Like, exploit it. Exploit it. For game. Run it up. Get yeah. your bag. Like, run it up. But until then, like, just aim for the for the ease. I love it. All right, ear horns. All right. Olympics. That was number one. Our next topic is bankruptcy trends. All right. Which not so fun wah, fact. Wah. I know. Like, <laughs> this is random. Bankruptcy. <laughs> but you remember Gabby Douglas? She was the gymnast from 2012 London Games. Yeah. Her mom actually said that she had to file for bankruptcy after the competition because of how much it cost <sighs> to train Gabby. Yeah, I'm sure. That's not the point of this. I think so, I watched the Lifestyle movie about her. Yeah. Or there was. A, I don't think I watched it. There probably was one. I think I remember something, too. Yeah, because I don't know anything about it. I was like, I don't think I watched it. It's yeah, because like, yeah, she had to like live away from home for like two yeah, years. I didn't watch it. Yeah, I watched it. Because I, yeah, I don't have any memory of it. Okay, bankruptcy trends. So bankruptcy has been on the rise for the last couple of years, but I looked up the first half of 2024, and commercial filings, so Chapter 11, is up 34 percent year over year, and individual filings are up 15 percent just in the first half of 2024. Now, on the commercial side, they're positioning it as like interest rate driven. A lot of companies who were hoping to see the rates lowered yeah. that didn't see that. They don't feel any hope. So they're just go ahead and like tapping out. But on the personal side, it's a mix of things. It's all the things that you've heard about causing economic struggles everywhere else. You know, inflation, credit card debt, student loans, all the yeah. things. But here's what made me want to talk about it today. There was a brand new research paper that has finally shown the impacts of legalizing sports betting, and they found that legalized sports betting increased bankruptcies by 28%. 28%. So when you've got this wow. steadily increased thing that's already happening, it's already part of the culture and the zeitgeist, and then you add this like flame of legalized sports betting, it made me wonder, do we think the stigma around bankruptcy is going to start declining? And the reason I say that is because as I'm reading the stories, as I'm listening to people talk about it, the word relief is a really common word that people to use say, to yes. describe it. And whenever you see trends like this, where something that is morally shunned upon becomes more and more popular, it means they're either going to make it harder to do, they're going to make it easier to do, or we're just going to normalize it. And it's just going to be another thing that people have as an option. Yeah. It feels the same way that divorce did like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. where it used to be, you know, very like kids are not going to be okay. You're not going to be okay. What about the family to now people have like parties celebrating it. There's women who are all, you know, excited about the new beginnings. Like, yes, there's some collateral damage, but at the end of the day, people are okay with it. Yeah. Even though there's a moral argument against doing divorce or bankruptcy, they're both like perfectly legal. And I'm wondering with these trends, like, will it start to be encouraged? I think that's a really good observation. And I would agree with you. It's like the relationship between credit and bankruptcy, right? Like it's almost like the end or the result of, you know, prolonged periods of time where things aren't really, really going well, similar with divorce, right? But I think you're right. I think we'll likely start to see um, enhances in technology and, 
you know, content, more content being created about bankruptcy and how easy it is to do now. And very similar, like what we saw with credit relief and credit repair over the last 10 years. Cause like once there's an opportunity to make money off of it, that's exactly what people are going to do. And that I think is going to set the tone for what they do to attract more people into the process. Yeah. And so um, that that's the American way of solving things. Like they're not going to make, they're not going to remove the thing that's creating the damage. They're just going to create a market to take all the people who are being damaged and move them into another thing that will yeah. allow them to continue to spend money, even though they haven't really learned anything to improve or they haven't put up any reinforcements or anything like that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that would be my prediction if I had to kind of create a little bit of a crystal ball. And, and I think culturally or socially, I, I think you're right in that there will just be a deterioration of the stigma and just a recognition that it is a, a legal filing. And that's really all it is. It now, is. You're, you're disregarding in a lot of cases, like the long-term ramifications of going through that filing process. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, I think the ease of conducting the transaction or initiating the process is likely what is likely going to be promoted. And, and I, by the way, like, when this happens, that does not make me a genius at all. This right. is just kind of what happens. Reading the tea leaves. Yeah, this is just kind of how things happen in the United States. In fact, I'm sure someone watching this might say, oh, yeah, well, that's already happening right now out in California or wherever the hotspots might be, Florida, Nevada, wherever, like, you see, you know, like, smoke you know, literally, whether it's coming from the loss of home and real estate due to climate change or it's the epicenter of legalized gambling and sports betting. Like, yeah, when things fall apart, there's a market ready there. No different than there's a market for movers or a market for a cleanup crew after a disaster. Like, this is all it is. It's just a financial version of those things. So, yeah, yeah. I don't think that that's going to... um I don't think that that's going to be very far away at all. Yeah. It's when you look at the history of the United States and bankruptcy and debtors, like in the 1800s, you used to go to jail oh, you when you owed back. people. Okay. <laughs> like you used to, we me. had debtors jail, like debtors prison. And then in biblical times, it was even worse. It was an eye for an eye. Like you got to retaliate if somebody owed you something. I'm going to take yours. And so now we don't really have like a formal brick and mortar debtors prison anymore. But I would say bankruptcy is pretty close. Like it's right up there with like cash bail in terms of like, it ain't that, but it's adjacent. Yeah. Because to your point, it's a very legal process. It's between you and a court system. So basically for anyone who's not familiar with how it works, I've never filed for bankruptcy, but this is my understanding. You file the paperwork, you go before a judge and you're transparent about your entire financial situation. And then the court takes all of your assets, the things that you own and liquidates them. They yeah. sell them. Right. And that's what they pay your creditors back with. Yeah. Sometimes it's something. A lot of times it's nothing, but they're going to take whatever you have and try to make things right with your creditors. And that's the part that people focus on because it does feel like a hard reset. Like yeah. it does feel like you control alt deleted, like whew, financial slate is clean. It's my chance to start a new like it's it's yeah, a new it, beginning. It is, it is, except it it's really also very difficult for you to qualify for a loan. That's it. Right. The and so consequences. you really better be in a position where you are able to fund your life through other means. Yes. And you really better hope that you've developed the discipline to uh, manage a budget and any amount of money that you already have because your ability to borrow money is going to be practically impossible. It's not just borrow money. For like the next decade. You're right. It's renting an apartment. It's applying for jobs. Applying for jobs. All those things. It's not just about losing your belongings. Like it truly is a financial scar. Like what I was, was that about to show say. where he had the scar across his face that everybody could see? It's yeah. a financial scar that's available to so many different Yeah places in society, different lenders, different decision makers. And it tells people that you had a hard time at some point, like you went through something. It's and, just, and, and you are not credit worthy. Yeah. And, and I almost said trustworthy because like, that's really what they're saying. Financially trustworthy. They're saying you are not credit worthy and you, it's like an admission of guilt. It's like going to court and filing guilty and say, yo, I, I did it. I yeah. don't know what I'm doing. Like it's a wrap. Yes, that's me. You yeah. know, I did it. And yeah, there's, there's a, this certainly is beyond a stigma. It's, it's just like, to your point, a scar that is, um, you know, 
it's like an asterisk on your name it and is. your application and your credit history going forward. And uh, it takes a really, really long time for that thing to go away. I do remember we we went back and forth about doing an episode and we may actually have to go a little bit deeper on that. I have not explored bankruptcy as a topic in a really long time, but I think now, given the trends that you just said, maybe a really, really good time for us to revisit that just to help people better understand the differences between the chapters and yeah. all that stuff. I need to like dig deep on it myself because it's been a while, but... Um, and why judging people who take that as an option is really tricky. Yeah. It's really tricky. It's easy to feel like you're on higher moral ground because, yeah. you know, if you borrowed it, you should pay it back. Until you look at what these companies are doing and realizing how much of it is predatory. To me, you're better focused critiquing the lenders, writing your your congressmen oh, yeah. than taking aim at people who take advantage of a perfectly legal option. Like it's it's there, just like divorce, just like changing your name, just like moving your address, like it's there. And I think more people are going to opt for it. Yeah, you sound like Donald Trump. All right, moving on. <laughs> Let's go. So the third topic that we're going to talk about today, and this one is really interesting. I, I dare I say maybe a little complicated, so we may have to do a little bit of explaining, but we'll see. Okay, so first let me start with talking about dynamic pricing. So dynamic pricing is basically when businesses increase a price to take advantage of higher periods of demand. Yes. Right. You see this on airlines. I was just about to say, yeah, there's like, you want to travel over Labor Day? Guess what? You and everybody else, it, that same seat, that same flight, that same airline at that same time is going to cost you 50% more yes. on that particular day. And it's typically based on inventory. Right. We only got three seats left and it's 14 of y'all that want them. Right. I'm going to raise the price and see which three of y'all is going to bite. Right. So, and this is very much data driven, right? This yes. is what's like underneath all of this. Then there's personalized pricing, which is kind of like it's creepier cousin, which is like, you know, mm -hmm. this is the price that I'm just going to offer you for really no reason other than the fact that I know a lot about you. Yeah. And I think you like this and want this. And so here's a little something that I think you might want to take a look at. And you let me know if you feel like buying something today. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very sophisticated. Uh, it happens like pretty regularly. And you know, I, can't, I don't think people even realize that this is happening. Uh, like most things at the intersection of finance and technology, like you don't realize it's happening. You just think that what you saw is what everybody else saw. It was like, no, yeah. that was the price for you. Yes. And I that's didn't the get that difference price. between dynamic pricing, which is based on inventory and this personalized surveillance pricing, which is based on you as an individual. Your tendencies, your desires, your willingness Your credit to history, pay. your demographics, Correct. your location, your everything, your so, spending habits. Yeah. So what's happening now, and the reason why we're bringing it up is because there's uh, now surveillance pricing. And this is basically a very mysterious data-driven algorithm, AI, like super, very, if you can imagine, you know, at any time you're talking about these things and people, you know, immediately start to defer to social media and maybe like Facebook advertising, which sort of touts itself on its ability to present certain advertisements to people based on like a really, really deep, rich, like set of data. Well, this is starting to happen now, like not just in advertising uh, on social media, but just pretty much everywhere. It's like the new, more sophisticated way of marketing. Um, it's becoming a problem. And so the FTC, like surprise, surprise. <laughs> it's a problem because we don't know how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and they won't tell us. They're like, oh, it's algorithmically, oh, artificially it's intelligence combined with other technologies. It's like, well, how, but how, Sway? So you're monitoring people and then presenting offers to them, right? That sounds um, enemy of the state. Um, <laughs> so the FTC just issued an order to Last week. eight companies uh, recently to basically say, hey, man, we want to know a little bit more about what you're doing and why, how um, this is all really as they are, in my opinion, still trying to figure out and catch up with these tech companies who are like completely zoomed past the government. But they're like, yeah, we've got like concerns around privacy and competition and just kind of protecting our citizens as consumers. And so they're basically just starting to dig into it. Um, yeah, they just this filed. This is a great example of what you were saying earlier order. today, where it's like, all right, we can talk about these things, but like you might not actually see anything really done until, you know, maybe a year from now, if you're lucky, assuming you're lucky. it becomes a hot topic of conversation in the broader 
political landscape. But like, look how long it took them to get Ticketmaster to be transparent about the costs once they add in all their fees and right. stuff. Like, it takes a while. But everybody's been noticing this for the last couple of years. You can't go nowhere without somebody saying, like, I did not search it, but I talked about it and it showed up in my feed the next day and it was on sale. And so, like, lucky perfect me, timing. I bought <laughs> perfect timing. Look at God. I was like, no, nah, that wasn't God. <laughs> that was not God. That was McKinsey. <laughs> That, that was, was Accenture. Yeah. JP Morgan and American Express teaming up <laughs> that was, to present you. That was with an offer. surveillance pricing. And that is what the FTC is researching. You know what this makes me think of? This makes me think of the people who put emojis over their kids' faces when they post pictures, or you know, they have all these locked accounts on social media where you can't see nothing. I'm here, but you can't <laughs> see me. I got all my Invisa spray on. Yeah. All because they're notoriously private, quote unquote. Meanwhile, they universally accept all the cookies on every website, which basically allows websites to track your online behavior and create detailed profiles about your activity. Downloading apps and playing yeah, games. Yeah, you use single sign-on every time and tether your Gmail account or your Facebook yeah. account just to get a login, which is the equivalent of giving like the Amazon delivery driver your key and expecting them to just like put the mail in. Don't. It's a lot of trust there. Like, don't, don't look around. Don't look around. Just put the mail in and go. They keep location services on every day. So these companies are familiar with where, where you, you be, go, <laughs> how what you time, move. how long you were there. Have to, yeah, listen, yeah. automatically connect to public Wi-Fi with a VPN. So your browser history, your financial documents, all this is up for sale. And, and the point is like, yes, that was a slight read, but don't come for me if you're an emoji face poster. Like I <laughs> understand your reasons. It's just that I only agree with like one or two of them. Most of them are just like, I don't know. The larger point here is that our privacy has been up for grabs for a solid decade, if not more. Oh, I was like, about to say it's a lot longer than that. Us, probably close to 20 years, but I'm giving us a little bit of leeway because they didn't have anywhere to store all this big data, certainly didn't have ways to access it. Now they do. And so the photos, your profile is like the least of your concerns. This is a problem. And it's also not new. Like they've been doing this for a while. We're just used to surge pricing being based on inventory or being the benefactor of it because you got a discount. Like they offer you a discount because they know you got good credit or they offer you a sale because they know you're looking to buy within the next week. So you've benefited from it. Now what we'll see is that actually you can afford to pay a little more than your neighbor. And so and you will. And you will, because that's what we taught them the last couple of years with inflation. That's why our interest rates are crazy. Yeah. And the other thing is that this is not illegal. It turns out that discriminatory pricing is only illegal for some goods. So things like houses, like big assets, big institutional assets that are like underwritten by the government and its loans. That's where it's illegal to discriminate based on price yeah. for the can of beans or your beach towel or your Bluetooth speaker. There's no rules. Because Services for sure. Right. And, and, and to, to see your point, like we've already shown that in many cases we're willing to do it. And so if you were willing to do it once, like they're like, well, why not and do it again? Yes. Uh, yeah. Listen, I, it's funny. It's actually not funny, but I remember, um, what was it? Whatever, how long ago it was with the Trump assassination attempt. And, uh, there was, you know, it's the first time in my life that I get at first I thought it was like, no, nah, that's not real. Because, you know, when it first happened, it was like shots s supposedly fired. Right. That was the first that and I was like, wait, what? And then I started seeing like imagery and I was like, oh, no, that was that was real. But then there was all the talk about maybe it wasn't. I, I'm not getting into all that. I, it, it brought me right back to like post 9-11. Because yeah. I remember that time period where the government said, at all costs, we will invade privacy to hunt down the people responsible for this. And I, that's what it made me. I plugged out. It's the first time I've ever done it. I plugged out um, uh, the Echo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at, at that point, I was like, nah, I don't even want to. Uh, nope. Yeah, we were just talking about it over dinner. Like, do you think it's nah, real? He was like, hold up. Hold on. Rip plug that. it out. <laughs> Rip that cord. I don't want to know. <laughs> turn your phone off. Turn your phone <laughs> off and then we can talk. But, uh, yeah, because you just never, you know, it'd be little stuff like that where it's like, yeah, well, your search history and your musical playlist preferences <laughs> Make you a suggest suspect. that you might have had something to do with this. Like, I, I, I'm not even in the mood for an error to be the case. But in all seriousness, I think, you know, and to your point, like we, we have very much sold ourselves out 
in exchange for discounts and perks and membership services and things like that. And so privacy without question is is going to be hopefully at a premium and, and you know, it's at a premium now, right? Like we generally just give it away, right? You assume uh, privacy, but like you really don't have much. And so it, it's all kind of connected. Like the fact that we have openly and willingly engaged in all of these acts online have essentially given carte blanche access to a lot of these corporations to use that information uh, to help increase profits, which comes at the expense of consumers and certainly comes at the expense of our privacy. It's one of the reasons why, and we only scratched the surface with it, but when we launched the financial technology toolkit, it's really just to kind of help people catch up a little bit and say, hey man, like this is not new. Like I remember we went back and forth around it, like whether or not we should even do this because surely everybody knows it. And then I learned pretty quickly, like actually, no, there's a lot of stuff that was really new that people hadn't heard about, but there were things that I had known about for like over 10 years that a lot of people really just hadn't, you know, had a chance to kind of dive into. And they're already using these things and they're completely unaware of how it's impacting their financial lives. And so we will add that toolkit to the link as well. If anyone doesn't have it and you want to get it, uh, you can use that toolkit. It's free. It's basically a, a quick catch up of all the different financial and technology tools that you could be using to help you save, invest and protect your money. I think the protect part was like one of the most overlooked aspects of that conversation. We also did a podcast episode about it. So you can go back and listen to that if you want. But we talk about all of the different things that you could and at this point should be doing in order to ensure that you're at least clear on what you're sacrificing and where you're at risk, because I think many of us are prioritizing other more, let's say, uh, visible or physical risks in our lives. Like we know to be safe for certain things, but we are pretty reckless when it comes to protecting our finances, certainly from a digital and an internet based or mobile phone based standpoint. So yeah, I, I'm not surprised that this is surging. No, uh, no pun. <laughs> I that pun intended. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised by that. I, I think I'm not surprised. again, this is this is a natural byproduct of where we are, and um, you know, I, our government is always going to be behind the eight ball. You know, these tech companies are moving at a pace a hundred times faster than watchdogs are able to uh, do, which sort of gives criminals an opportunity and a head start to kind of get ahead before the general public does. And then they start doing really sophisticated things to help get your money, especially during periods right now where people just don't really see it happening. You get a text message and you think you're doing the right thing to support your local councilman because you want to support this candidate or you're grinding to find a job and you think you're going to a website to fill out an application. Meanwhile, you just gave, you just get, you literally just gave someone your name, your address, and all your of the information that they need in order to assume all of your passwords. And by the way, that same password is one that's used for 10 of your accounts. And so now I have access to all of it Listen. and your money is wiped away and you don't even know what happened. It's not like some skeleton pops up on your screen, you know, and says, ha, 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 ha. Like that's what happens in the movies. Gotcha, bitch. It's just gone. <laughs> you don't find out until maybe a You week, never find a week out. Later. You just get annoyed by being inundated by other political candidates that you've never even heard of. Yeah. Or, you know, I think about even the season that we're in now, by the time Bo is able to vote, I don't think we'll be doing all this. Like I had a Zoom call and then donated money and gave away my email address. And now they can email. Now this party has my email address <laughs> right. and can shape the things that I And can I share see. it with thousands of other organizations. And you wonder why you receive 100 text messages. It's every crazy. Day. But even beyond just like the cultural and how it shapes our our country, when you think about how it's going to affect you on an everyday basis, the biggest issue is that you don't know what you're paying for anymore. This is slowly chipping away at the idea that the price of something is based on what it takes to produce and a reasonable amount of profit. What this is saying is like, the price that you pay is strictly based on whatever value they've determined that yep. you're willing to pay for it. Yep. And that's what feels like a violation that happens in B2B business transactions, which is why the sales cycle is like months long because it's not meant to be impulsive. It's right. not meant to be invasive like this when it's on an everyday basis for your everyday goods. 
it feels like it's a violation. Like, for example, Uber was accused of using surge pricing on people's rides when their battery was low because they knew they were desperate. You knew you needed a ride. You didn't have time to shop around. And so, like, let me charge you this. And there's always going to be a group of people that think that's strategic. That's brilliant. Like, they're going to win an ad age marketing award for that. And then there's always going to be consumers who will gladly pay it because, like, it is what it is. Money ain't a thing. Like, you got to live a little. Those people will always exist. But at what point does it become predatory? When there's no regulation, and I'm not, like, pro-regulate everything, but when there's no rules, there's no boundaries, how do you know that it's not going to be when you're 10 centimeters dilated, the delivery is now 14 right. times How more? How much you to pay for <laughs> oh, you got an emergency? Some, some medicine? You got a knife in your head? Like, yeah. where does it stop? And that's really, you know, based on history, based on things that, like, college education and <laughs> eggs two years ago. Like, we know that these companies just really don't have the wherewithal to stop it themselves, which is why we focus on technology. If you don't have a price tracking tool, get you one. Honey is an example. If you use Amazon, they've got camel, camel, camel. If you just Google price tracking tool, like several will come up. If you don't have one, go ahead and download that on your Chrome. I know I'm giving away information, but like (laughs) at least helps you track in the interim. Behavior is really the biggest change. Like this is why we say frugality is a superpower. The ability to be intentional about what moves you to buy something, what moves you to spend your money matters. And the ability to speak up about when you don't like something. If you think this is unfair, then like say something. Don't just keep buying it. Don't just keep taking it. Like either stop buying it or say something. Well, what was that? We talked about the Olympics. We talked about bankruptcy and we talked about surge pricing technology surveillance pricing. surveillance pricing excuse me and how those things are kind of impacting our spending habits um let us know what you guys think that was fast it was fast and i wanted to, to keep going uh I, I could tell you wanted to keep on going but i think we're gonna stop this <laughs> i don't quite uh, understand the format yet yeah, she's like, oh, yeah what's the next one yeah like let me, let me, let me air <laughs> There were a couple of them where it's like, no, this could be a whole podcast because I got something to say. Clearly. (laughs) (laughs) But yes, if you like this format, if you want to hear the other five to seven things on my list, we will do another episode. We're probably going to do it anyway, like he said, because I already got the list. But if you like it and don't want to miss it, make sure that you subscribe. And thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular Podcast. If you like what you heard on this episode, let us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on any of your favorite podcast platforms, or you can drop a comment below. We'll keep the conversations going. We'll argue about the merits of bankruptcy and individual pricing and Olympians. You know, I, you know, I like to fight. So leave a comment and we will see y'all next week. Peace. If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications. 